This section of the book is on a, just a very quick application of multiple integrals, of, of integrals in two and three dimensions. It's about average value of a function. Um, you may remember doing average value in single variable calculus, and this is the, the multivariable version of that. Um, in general, when, when a, a normal person talks about the average value of something, they've got a finite collection of numbers, and you add them up and divide by the total number of numbers. So you know, if you've got 10 numbers and want their average value, you add the 10 numbers together and divide by 10. That's the average value. What's the problem with, well, what problem are we going to address? We're going to have a function on a region in, um, in R2 or a function on a region in R3, and they're going to be an infinite number of values of the function. So what's the average value of the function? Well, you can't just say, oh, you add up the value of the function at each point, divide by the total number of numbers, you get one infinity divided by another. So there's something to do in defining average value. So let me give you the motivation, and then we, we do make a definition in terms of integrals, but it is motivated by just the standard, oh, the, the average value of a finite number of numbers, you just add the numbers together and divide by how many of them you had. So um, suppose we had a function. F, and I'm going to assume it's a function of three variables and then I'll just state the two variable definition by analogy but I could do two variables instead of three. Suppose I have a function of three variables. Um, then the average value of f at a finite number of points, this is the easy one, what, what you should be used to, the average value of f at a finite collection of points, uh, the average value over a finite collection of points, points in R3, where F is defined, call them P1 through Pn, is just, well, what you'd expect. You you take the sum of f at each of those points, so you just take, you add up the value of f at each of your points, and you divide by the total number of points, n. <clears throat> Alright, so that's the easy definition, and the question is, how do we pass from this finite average value to average value over whole, kind of region with an infinite number of points. So um, how to define how <coughs> do we define the average value of f? Same f, three, vari three variables. The average value of f over a solid region S. And in the two-dimensional case, you would do this over a plane region. And you could do this in any number of dimensions, but you know, we're just trying to do easy applications of integration right now, or straightforward ones, so I'm just going to deal with two and three dimensions. Well, what you could do, you try, you should be used to this by now. When you do integration, you chop things up into little pieces and do approximations. So what you could do is um, suppose S has volume V. And we chop S up into in pieces 
each uh, volume delta v. So that the total volume is the number of pieces times this little volume. So what are we doing? You take your solid region. We know the average value of a finite number of points. So what we do is what we frequently do with integrals. We'll chop up our solid region into lots of little pieces. We'll pick a sample point in each piece. We will then take it will have a finite number of pieces. You take a sample point in each piece and you take the average value over those sample points. Now, so you just evaluate your function at each sample point, add those together, and divide by the number of points. That doesn't sound like an integral. I mean, the chopping up and picking sample points should, but so um, of course there's a problem here. You can't, you know, if you try to chop S up into in pieces each of volume delta v, well you might worry, oh, you know, we really want to picture little rectangular boxes, little rectangular solids, oh, maybe some would hang over the edge, some wouldn't. We dealt with that problem when we defined integration. It's in the limit, it's not going to matter whether you, some of the boxes hang over the edge and you only have partial ones or not, so I'm just going to ignore that for now, I mean, for the rest of the discussion. But, um, so suppose you do this, you pick, pick a point, pi, in the ith piece that you chopped s up into. And then you take the average value. You, so, and then consider exactly the sum I wrote before. The sum as i goes from 1 to n of f evaluated at p i divided by n. And what you'd like to do, well, this is an approximation of the average value. We'd like to take the limit as n goes to infinity. As you chop this up into smaller and smaller pieces, more and more smaller and smaller pieces, we would like to take the limit of this. But this doesn't look like anything you get from integration. But then you get sneaky. You multiply the numerator and denominator by delta v, um, which is a constant. So you can distribute it over this sum. So I can put this over here. And down here, I'll get delta v. But n times delta v is just v. So what you end up with is 1 over v times this sum. But this sum is a Riemann sum. It's the value of the function at a sample point times how much volume is in the little rectangular box we chopped it up into. Um, you know, maybe missing some pieces. So the limit as n goes to infinity here is the Riemann integral, assuming the Riemann integral exists. And here's just one over the volume. So in the limit, Consider the limit as n goes to infinity. And what you get is that this goes to 1 over the volume times the triple integral over our solid region s of f dv. So this is how you define, in the, at the end of the day, this is our motivation, but at the end of the day what you do is you define the average value of function on a solid region to be this triple integral divided by the volume provided that, um, provided, well, you have to have a volume that exists, so, and you, you need f to be Riemann integrable over s. So this is, actually maybe I'll write it over here, the average value of a function of two variables, you do, you'd get area instead. So if f is a function of two variables, the average value of f on some region r in R2 
is 1 over the area of our, actually I'll just write A, um, times the double integral over R of F dA. So this is the area of R. And yeah, if F is a function of three variables, then the average value is just what we, what we derived. Namely, 1 over the volume times the triple integral over the solid region of FDV. So, um, this is how you define average value. Uh, it's, a, it's not particularly easy to take a given function in a given region and just kind of intuitively see the average value. You might be able to see <coughs> sort of what it might be. I mean, you might be able to say something qualitative about it, but it would be hard to find it exactly just by looking. Um, I should say the average value does have one very desirable property, or it has a number of desirable properties. But one of them, you know, can you say anything nice at all about the average value? And the answer is, well, yes, it's certainly between the maximum and the minimum value of the function on the region. It better be where it's a really bad notion of average value. If the average value of a function on a region isn't somewhere between the minimum value of the function on the region and the maximum, that's a bad notion of average value. But that's true because assuming like S is bounded, for instance, or closed and bounded so that an F is continuous, so that F does attain maximum and minimum values on the region, one of the things that you should remember about integration is, well, it's called monotonicity. And it's just if one thing is less than another, if one function's less than or equal to another, then the integrals have the same inequality holds for the integrals. And so what that would tell you is if f is always between some maximum and minimum, uh, minimum and maximum value on s, then when you integrate, when you integrate, the inequality stays in the same direction, or the two inequalities stay in the same direction. But the minimum value is a constant. You can just pull this out. The maximum value is a constant. You can just pull that out. This, the triple integral, over S of dV is just the volume of S, just like it is down there. So you get the volume, so you get M times V. Down here you get capital M times V. And then V is a positive number, assuming we have a region that has some volume. And if you divide, so you don't change the inequalities when you divide, so you get this. Good. Well, you know, what that tells us is, oh yes, the average value of a function is between its maximum values and its minimum values. Good. All right. Let's, let's look at a couple of easy examples. Let's do a one two-dimensional example and one three-dimensional example. So let's try example. Find the average value of the function distance squared from the origin. over the region 
under the graph of y equals x squared over the region under the graph of y equals x squared and above the interval from 0 to 2. Alright, so um, it's just a straightforward, well, two, you have to do two integrals, but they're both very straightforward. You have to do one integral to find you know, the triple integral of the function we're interested in, uh, the double integral of the function we're interested in, and we have to do another double integral to even find the area to divide by. But one nice thing is your limits of integration don't need to change. They're the same. So our region R under the parabola under the parabola y equals x squared above the interval from 0 to 2 uh, above the interval from 0 to 2 so here's our region R we need to calculate two integrals one for the area and one for well the double integral of distance squared from the origin, that function is just x squared plus y squared. So what's the average value of f? Well, it's the double integral over the region of x squared plus y squared dA divided by, well, the, the area. But to do that, you have to calculate the double integral over R of just one dA. Our limits of integration, we're going to do this in Cartesian coordinates. So we're just going to, we'll let x go from 0 to 2 and y goes from 0 to x squared. use the exact same limits of integration down here. It's just your integrand changes to 1. And so we have to calculate these two relatively easy integrals and divide. Um, you, can, you could, you know, the distance squared function, what point is the farthest away? It's this one at 2, 4. The squared, the squared distance to there would be 2 squared plus 4 squared, so 4 plus 16, 20. The minimum distance is 0, so we, distance squared is 0, so we better get something, a number between 0 and 20, but that's all we can say from maximum minimum calculations, but let's see what we actually get. So uh, why don't we, we can do this bottom integral and probably do that in this amount of space. This one, because you just get integral from 0 to 2. And really this is just y. You evaluate at x squared and subtract what you get at 0. So you just get x squared evaluate, integrated from 0 to 2. So you get x cubed over 3 evaluated from 0 to 2. So that's 8 thirds. So the bottom one was easy. The top one's not hard either. It's just uh, <clears throat> the numbers do come out a little worse, or <laughs> significantly worse. But all right, zero to two, zero to x squared, x squared plus y squared, dy dx. You get the integral from zero to two. This inside integral, you get x squared y plus y cubed over 3, evaluated as y goes from 0 to x squared, and then you want to integrate again with respect to x, so you get 
you get, oh, you put in y is x squared, you get x to the fourth plus x to the sixth over three minus what you get at zero, but that's zero, so we just get this. So you get x to the fifth over five plus x to the seventh over 21 evaluated between 0 and 2. Certainly at 0, it's 0, but you get, so you get 2 to the 5th over 5 plus 2 to the 7th over 21. Yes, we could calculate those, get a common denominator <clears throat> and add. Uh, I have cheated, however, and I have this written down. Um, So what we get for the average value, we get up in the numerator, we're getting this 2 to the 5th over 5 plus 2 to the 7th over 21. In the denominator, we're getting 8 thirds. And if you simplify this, you come up with 164 30 fifths, which is approximately 4.5. Six, eight, five, seven. So, it's uh, it's good. We got <laughs> something between zero and twenty. So, all right, that's an example of calculating average value over two-dimensional regions. So, in R two, let's just do one example in R three. All right. You could count this as two examples because I'm going to find the average value of two different functions but over the same region. However, one of the functions will know what we're going to get ahead of time. You might wonder how that's possible. You'll see. Example. Consider the solid region. Under the graph. We're just going to have um, a circular paraboloid under the graph of z equals 4 minus x squared minus y squared and above the xy plane, consider the solid region S and above the xy plane. So, you know what that looks like. It looks like this it intersects the xy plane in a dit, well, in a circle. So, our solid region is under, under this circular paraboloid above the xy plane. And find the average. value of, of the y-coordinate and the z-coordinate. In that region. So what does that mean we're doing? It means, well, our function, here the function is just y, so here we'll use the function f of x, y, z is y. And here we'll use the function g of x, y, z is z. Now one of these average values is supposed to be intuitively obvious. Uh, my picture doesn't look very symmetric because my sketch is kind of lopsided. But you should know this, this graph is completely symmetric around the, the positive z axis. So the average y coordinate, if math is working right today, the average y-coordinate should be zero by symmetry. It should be on the z-axis. So should the average x-coordinate. But the average z-coordinate, that, that one you should, you know, isn't so clear. The average z-coordinate is, well, somewhere between zero and four. This height is four. It's somewhere between zero and four. In fact, you ought to be able to see intuitively that the average z-value is closer to the bottom 
because there are more there's more volume down here at a given z coordinate so that you know, the z the z values down here get counted you count more of them um, but let's see we'll see what we get but first I want to see that really if you do the average value calculation for y you really do get zero is that true well the average value is the triple the triple integral of y over the region divided by the volume of the region if it's going to come out to be zero the triple integral of y over the region has to be zero before you divide by the volume right so well here's our question why is or is it true that the triple integral over s of y dv is zero this is this is what we're pretty sure of, but we want to check that math is working right today. Um, it may occur to you that this problem isn't as nice as it could be in Cartesian coordinates. You could do it in Cartesian coordinates, but it's nicer in cylindrical coordinates, and also it's good practice with cylindrical coordinates. So I'm going to switch everything into cylindrical coordinates to do this problem. That means we use r and theta instead of x and y, but z stays as z. So we want the triple integral over s of y dv. I'm going to put the z integral on the inside as is frequently the case. Y, though, is r sine theta. The y-coordinate and cylindrical coordinates is r sine theta. dv is a d, dz, and then there's an r dr d theta area in, the x, in polar coordinates in the xy plane. So now we have an r dr d theta. Put the extra r here, dr d theta. So you get this. Um, your z coordinate is um, oh, actually, I don't want the z coordinate on the inside. Let's, in fact, let's put the theta coordinate on the inside. We don't usually do that, but it'll be nice right here. So um, <laughs> um, okay. I'm going to have to change that order too, but let me write what's going on. So we've got z equals 4 minus x squared minus y squared. That is z in, in cylindrical coordinates. That's just z is 4 minus r squared. Um, okay, fine. So my z coordinate will depend on r when I go, when I integrate over the solid region. So I really can't have z in front of the r, but I can have theta on the inside, which I really would like. So now, leaving this as our final <laughs> order of things, we need for theta to go all the way around, all the way around the circle, to get to get well, to go all the way around the, the uh, circular paraboloid. Z needs to go from 0 up to 4 minus R squared. And R goes from, well, that circle down there is where Z is 0. That's R squared equals 4. So R is 2. So R goes from 0 to 2. So this is the triple integral that we'd like to do. Now, I've really, this is the order that I'd like the variables in, but I've realized that this may be slightly confusing for you because we always talk about projecting and then doing it. So I should, I should back up for a second and put the z back where I had it initially, even though I do want that order. I just want to say why this is okay. So. Um, normally, I like this order, dz, dr, d theta, because it's easy to see the projection of this into the xy plane. 
it's um, you get this disk in the bottom, and then oh, these limits of integration just tell you how to integrate over that disk. So you would use theta goes from zero to two pi to go all the way around the disk, and r goes from zero to two, and then your limits of integration on z, yeah, for any point in that projected region, your z coordinate goes from zero to four minus r squared. But it's true that we can move the order of the integrals to do this um, and do the theta integral first um, because these limits of integration are only depending on r. And I would like to do the theta integral first, but if that bothers you, you don't have to exactly because in this integral with the z, sine of theta is a constant, right? For that matter, r is a constant, but I at least want to move the sine of theta out. It's a constant. So you've got this. Then in that next integral, it's with respect to r. Well, that's a constant. sine of theta is a constant again with respect to r. And so you get some number here and you'll multiply it times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of sine of theta d theta. So you can do the sine integral first whether you reorder or whether you do it in the standard order and keep pulling sine out. Why do I want to do the sine integral first? Because it's 0 and it's obviously 0. And if you do the theta integral first, you can pull the r squared out the integral of sine of theta minus cosine of theta, but you evaluate it 2 pi and subtract what you get at 0. Well, minus cosine is 2 pi periodic. Well, the minus cosine at 2 pi is, is minus 1, and you subtract, you subtract, so you're taking this integral right here, and you get minus cosine of theta evaluated from 0 to 2 pi, so you get minus the cosine of 2 pi, so you get the minus 1, and then you get minus what you get at 0, which is minus 1, so you get 0 on the nose. And that's what you get if you just think, oh, this is some constant, I don't know what it is, call this, these two inside integrals anything, call that constant anything, pull it out, and then you have, you still have the integral from 0 to 2 pi of sine of theta d theta which is zero. So whether you move it, whether you make it the first inside integral, or whether you just think of it this way, you don't need to do these, this part of the integral. The sine theta part is already giving you zero, as we knew it would. We knew our average y coordinate would be zero. All right. Yes. But what about the z coordinate? Well, the average z coordinate is different. You have to put a z here, and then you won't have the sine of theta making things zero. We can still use the same limits of integration. So what's the average z coordinate? Well, we need to calculate triple integral over s of z dv and then divide by the triple integral over s of just dv. Um, this will give us the volume, and this, this is the triple integral of z over the volume, so this is the average value of the z coordinate. So, yeah, we can use the limits of integration we had before and maybe pick a, a sane order this time. So, so z in cylindrical coordinates is just z, and I will put, you have a, a dz, and then r dr d theta, just put the r here, dr d theta, and z is going from 0 to 4 minus r squared. r is going from 0 to 2 and theta is going from 0 to 2 pi. And you have exactly the same limits of integration down here, it's just your integrand is 1. Or, ah, well, your integrand is 1 before you multiply by that extra r. 
your integrand is just 1 times dv, but dv is r dz dr d theta. So. And you calculate both of these, and you divide, and you do get a very simple answer, so let me go ahead and do these. I guess I'll do them simultaneously. Um, an integral at a time. So you integrate with respect to z, you get rz squared over 2 evaluated as z goes from 0 to 4 minus r squared. You still have to integrate with respect to r and theta. And down here, you get the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to 2, and then just rz evaluated as z goes from 0 to 4 minus r squared, dr d theta. All right, I think I'm going to fit the next part over there. That's what I think I'm going to do. So... What do we get in the next stage? Well, I just need to evaluate this. So you get the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to 2. Plug in z is 4 minus r squared. Subtract what you get at z equals 0. Well, that's 0. I'm going to, so you get 1 half r times 4 minus r squared, quantity squared, dr d theta. And down here you get the integral from 0 to 2 pi of r times 4 minus r squared dr d theta. Um, we could expand this and multiply by the r and integrate. Uh, another nice thing to do, it's actually kind of set up nicely for substitution. If you let u be 4 minus r squared, then du would be minus 2r dr, and you have an r dr. Either one of those is fine. Um, the substitution would also work down here, where it's completely needless. It really would make the top integral a little simpler to do it by substitution instead of by expanding, so why don't we do that? I am going to let u be 4 minus r squared, so that du is um, minus 2r dr, so that minus 1 half du is r dr. And what we get then is that we get the integral from 0 to 2 pi. We get all right, the, we have the 1 half. The 4 minus r squared squared is now u squared. The r dr that we had is minus 1 half du. Um, and we still have to integrate with respect to theta after this. Um, I want to switch the indefinite integrals when you make a substitution. It's nicest to always go ahead and switch your limits of integration to what your substitution variable is, so, or does. So our r started at 0. When r is 0, u is 4. And r went up to 2. And when r is 2, u is 0. So in terms of u, those are limits of integration. Okay, and it's true that we can do that same substitution. Oh, I see I left off an integral sign. Hmm. Hopefully you noticed this. I wrote two differentials. I wrote that integral sign. That one seems to be missing. Okay. I hope you were paying attention and noticed that. Um, 
should we make the substitution down there? I don't know. It seems kind of pointless. So I, I guess I won't. But you get the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to 2 of 4r minus r cubed dr d theta. So you get the integral from 0 to 2 pi. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull out an entire, well, I can use that minus sign and reverse the order of the integration. So that's nice. I can pull out a half times a half. That's a fourth. So I get one fourth the integral from 0 to 2 pi. Um, and then, okay, I pulled out the fourth. We get u cubed over 3 evaluated as u goes from 0 to 4. And then I still have to integrate with respect to theta. And over here, you get the integral from 0 to 2 pi. You get 2r squared minus r to the fourth over 4 evaluated from 0 to 2. And you still have to integrate with respect to 2 pi. Um, you can do some simplifications now without integrating. This is some number, and you're going to pull that out, and the remaining integral will give you 2 pi. This is some number, and you can pull that out, and the remaining integral will give you 2 pi, but those 2 pi divided by 2 pi will give you just 1. So, in other words, they cancel, so those integrals go away. But maybe that's a little too tricky, and I shouldn't. Maybe I'll just go ahead and do it, but you get the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 64 thirds d theta. And down here, you get the integral from 0 to 2 pi of what you get when this is 2. So you get uh, 8 minus, minus uh, 16 over 4. So 8 minus 4. So I get 4 d theta. So I'm getting 1 fourth times 64 thirds times, pull that out, times 2 pi. And down here I'm getting 4 times 2 pi. The 2 pi's cancel. Um, the 2 pi's cancel. You get 64 divided by 16 thirds. So that is 4 thirds. Phew! That was an easy example. Um, so we got the average z-coordinate is 4 thirds. You know, it gets a little, it's not short, but it's not particularly long. No part of it was difficult. We made a substitution, but that's not bad. Um, is it reasonable that the answer is 4 thirds? Well, this is what I was saying before we started, that this circular paraboloid you know, it was bottom heavy. And so this top was at 4. And what we just found is the average z coordinate is one third of the way up at 4 thirds. So there's the average z coordinate. And as, as I said before, it's, um, you would expect it to be close to the bottom because there are more. There are more z coordinates down here because this thing is fatter at the bottom. So, and yeah, and that's what we're seeing. But I don't, I don't know of any way to look at it and go, aha, it's one third of the, it's just one third of the way up. Anyway, those are examples of average value. Average value is just kind of a quick standard application of, of multiple integrals. I should say that when you find the average x, y, and z coordinates, in a region. That's actually called the centroid of the region, but I'll talk about that more when we do um, mass and centers of mass.